Right now, we are going to have the pleasure to listen to Miss Carol Inlow. Well, I've only known her for 10 months, almost a year. She is absolutely amazing, and she will give you the shirt off her back. Her and her husband have been here for quite a while. He is an elder here at Broadway, and they give the most amazing cookouts at their house. We have so much fun, and she's always got a bright smile on her face, and she's the first one to jump in and help with anything that's going on around here. She taught here in Paducah for about 20 years. Um, she's still, every now and then, still substitute teaching, but mainly retired. She has two children and two cats and two dogs and lots and lots, six grandchildren, which she absolutely loves and spending time with. So at this time, I will give it to Carol, and we're excited to hear you. We are uh, all experience difficult times in our life. There's, go there's going to be the times that, that are just so hard, so difficult. But I hope that today it will encourage you. I've got some encouraging examples that have been encouraging to me and help you to view your um, past and present and future circumstances in a different light. I found several. Corey Tim Boom, everybody knows who she is, right? And uh, she had several inspirational quotes. And I like this one. It says, when a train goes through a dark tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You just sit still and trust the engineer. So we have to trust our engineer to get through the hard parts of life. I, got, I do have a lot of scripture. I found that as I get older, where do we need to go? We need to go to... We need to go to the Bible. That's where, that's where it comes from. That's where our, our strength uh, comes from. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So we, we do. Um, we live in a fallen world. Difficult times are just a part of life, but how we manage the, these parts for each of us are going to be very, very different. And a difficult situation for you might not be that difficult for another situation. I can remember being younger, and a difficult situation I thought was terrible was my curly hair. And I straightened and worked, and I thought, this is terrible. This is terrible. Why, did, why did God give me curly hair? I wanted straight hair, okay? But I finally came to the realization my hair's curly, okay? Not, and it's not so difficult anymore. But it doesn't matter how old we are, we're all going to face challenges as we go throughout our life. The hard parts of life could be longing for a child, longing for a spouse, longing for a better paying job, longing for a job, longing for happiness, longing to just like yourself. It could be a birth of a child with special needs, an accident resulting in a traumatic life-changing experience, terminal illness of a child or a parent or a spouse, or maybe your own. Could be permanent separation from someone you love dearly, uh, death of a child, loss of a spouse, loss of a parent. It could be a betrayal of a close friend or a family member. And a lot of times, some of the hard parts of life may not be all negative. Sometimes they're positive, but they're hard. Okay, a new baby crying, 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, a new career, although eager, eagerly anticipated, could be very, very, very stressful. So we need to fix our eyes on the focal point, Christ. We need to consistently fill ourselves up with him. Uh, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter includes the word various trials. So you need to just insert your suffering right here. And how do you prepare to suffer? And Peter says that our suffering helps us see if our faith is genuine. If your faith is genuine, then we have something to rejoice in. 
So in preparing for suffering, which may sound like an oxymoron, but I, I feel like we do need to be ready. We do that through God's Word. And God's Word needs to be active and living in you. And the only way we can pretty well do that is to study His Word, meditate on His Word, and pray. And dive into his word daily, meditate and pray without ceasing. Use the comfort of the Holy Spirit that God gives us. And 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, of love and self-control. I like to go and look at several different versions sometimes in scriptures. Uh, one version, instead of fear, is, makes, is timid. Right? So God doesn't make us timid, does he? I like this version. It's a little bit simplified, but it's pretty clear. God gave us his spirit, and the spirit doesn't make us weak and fearful. Instead, the spirit gives us power and love. He helps us control ourselves. Paul tells us in, first, in 2 Timothy 1 to guard the deposit entrusted to you and keep the pattern of sound teaching. He says that's why he's suffering as he is. Okay, because, and he says, it's no cause for shame. I know who I have believed. I'm convinced he's able to guard and what I have entrusted to him that day. So we need to be aware of the Holy Spirit. We guard that with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, to our selfishness and our sadness, God does not always choose to heal us. In one of Paul's letters, he talks about his own thorn in the flesh, some kind of a physical ailment. And so we all know that in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, 10, that he begged the Lord to take it away from him. But Christ said, no, my power works best in your weakness. In preparing for a little suffering, we've got to do a little pre preventative maintenance. You're a child of God. This is just, you're more than this earth. Now, we have several ladies here that have run marathons. Amanda, I think you probably run half, half, half marathon, okay? Well... I've never run like that, and I really don't plan to, but what do you do? Are you going to just get up that morning and go, oh, there's half marathon, at, and I'm, I'm going to run? No. No, you've got to run. You've got to train. You've got to prepare for months. You're going to Google a training schedule. That's what I'd have to do. You're going to eat certain foods. You're going to get yourself ready to run that race. So just like in running, preparing to run that race, we have to do the same thing with God's Word. We have to practice. We have to train spiritually by study and prayer, regular Bible study. And not only that, but we need to listen. We need to listen when God speaks to us. His word needs to be active, living in our heart. And as James says, the man who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and makes a habit of doing so, he won't forget. He puts the law into practice. So will we have struggles? Yes, we're going to have struggles. But is that struggle possibly going to be for God's glory? And have you been selected to struggle for God's glory? Max Licato wrote that he consoled a friend who was suffering with cancer in the hospital. With He told his friend, it's not about you. Your hospital room is a showcase for your maker. Your face, faith in the face of suffering cranks up the volume of God's song. When Lakato saw his friend about a week later, his friend said, I reflected God. To the nurses, the doctors, my friends, who knows who needed to see God, but I did my best to make him seen. God can use whatever he wants to display his, his glory. And he, and he does. Uh, losing someone you love is, is never easy. And loss of any kind can make us feel empty, negative. God has a purpose for this, to fill it with what is positive. 
He uses it like an artist that uses negative space to give us permission to pause and reevaluate and ultimately draw ourselves back to him. Maybe the point of loss is to show that it's not actually lost. While this earth will fade away, our God never will. You'll allow your pain to point you back to the positive God who loves you. A few years ago, we were privileged to have uh, Jennifer and Justin Gearhart speak here at Broadway. They did a marriage seminar. And Jennifer's latest book is Swallowed Up. I recommend if, uh, this book that will help you and comfort you or someone else that you know is grieving. She lost her brother when she, he was only 20 years old. She was 21. They were, they were very close. And uh, Jennifer says there's, there's no making something good out of something bad, but that God works in the wreckage to redeem our pain. Another wonderful example of, of faith is Sarah Pig Walker from Nashville, and I was in attendance at the Women of Hope Conference when they honored Sarah. Sarah had lost a healthy uh, baby girl just two weeks before her due date, and she delivered her stillborn baby girl on their seventh wedding anniversary. And six weeks later, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer on her 33rd birthday. She writes a blog, Savoring the Day, taking us through her journey of her last year and a half. The book, The Light Shines Through a Story of Hope in the Midst of Suffering, is a great example of seeing God's presence and, and how uh, to see his love in every moment, even those painful ones. Sarah had written that, do you know what I see people around me? I see uncontrolled spread of joy, of hope. I hear people praying everywhere. I'm witnessing rapid growth in spirituality as prayers become bolder. And she says, don't let or let hope metastasize from you all around you, spreading from person to person as you live your life in bold joy and bold celebration. So do you know what God may want for your life? He wants hope, peace, and joy, and he does. She, she quotes with, my greatest hope is that, again, no one will say I lost my battle with cancer. I hate that phrase. Cancer will not win. Jesus will win. End of story. And Sarah was 34. So don't begrudge your problem. Explore it. Ponder it. And most of all, use it to God's glory. Another great example of faith and encouragement is uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Many of you may have read some of her books or seen her speak. She was became a quadriplegic at age 17 after a diving accident. She's been in a wheelchair for five decades. She says that if Satan and God were involved in my accident, it must be that the devil had twisted God's arm for permission. And she said she could picture God running behind him saying, how am I going to fix this for the good? How am I going to fix it for the good? But Sarah, uh, Johnny says that I'm convinced that God's motive was to thwart the devil and use the wheelchair to change me and make me more Christ-like through it all. He can bring ultimate good out of the devil's wickedness. She has several ministries uh, and helps people all over the world. It's a great, great testimony of her faith. And one thing that she had said that it's not that Jesus did not care about the cancer-ridden and the paraplegics. It's just that their illness were not the main focus. The gospel was. Okay? It's hard to swallow, but the Bible specifically says that all who follow Jesus can expect, can expect hardships. We need to be watchful and sober-minded because our devil, our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. A few years ago, at Lipscomb Summer Celebration, I was privileged to hear Dr. Kent Bradley. If you'll remember, Dr. Bradley was in Liberia and diagnosed with Ebola. He overcame that deadly disease. One quote that he said, 
that to suggest that there was something that made God choose to save my life while he allowed 11,300 other people to die, I'm not really okay with that. He was grateful to God for saving his life. And he's been faithful to the calling. He had back to the mission field in Zambia. Something we carry with us as Christians is God. And that world, our world, desperately needs that. The Bible speaks of many trials where God has tested us and he's, he brought you into the net. He laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads and we went through fire and water. But you brought us out of a place of abundance. God doesn't always choose to heal our sufferings as we think he should, but he does promise he will always be with us. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you're through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame will not consume you. God will never be where you are not. Max Cato talks about it in this way. He gives an example. He says, God surrounds us in the same way the Pacific surrounds a ocean floor pebble. He's everywhere, above, below. And we choose our response. Are you a rock? Are you a sponge? Do you resist or do you receive? Do you harden your heart, run from God, resist God, blame God? Hard hearts will never heal but spongy ones do. We have to open every pore to God's presence. And what about Joseph? I love the Old Testament stories. I just, they're, they're just, they're just I, I just love the stories. And the story of Joseph, have you been, have you been thrown into a pit? I just can't even imagine as a, as a young person going through what he went through. Maybe you endured some of the same abuse he did. You've been thrown into the pit. You've been lied about. Your character has been defamed. But through it all, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So we need to prepare for our tribulations in advance and to keep God's word living in our heart did no matter the diagnosis and no matter how many relationships die. And Job said, Behold, I go forward. He is not there. Backward. And I do not perceive him. On the left hand, he is working. I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. And we know how Job, how Job suffered. So you, probably, you may have a dream that's shattered. You may have life not turned out as you planned. Um, I got thinking about, I've, I heard Tim Tebow's mother speak last year, and uh, this young man can, knows a lot about, even though he doesn't, he hasn't, um, you know, he hasn't endured cancer, hasn't, hasn't a, hadn't had a serious disease, but he does know about heartache and rejection, right? So we may have some football lovers here, or maybe football widows from the, for the season. He says it's important to circle back to God's love and the fact that he has an amazing purpose for your life because his dream, his dream to be an NFL quarterback was, has been shattered. We need to cling to God's character. We need to be more deeply, intimately acquainted with him and perceiving and recognizing the wonders of his person more strongly and, and clearly. We have to put our trust in him. We have to keep in mind God is sovereign. He knows my name. He is faithful to me, and he uses everything for his glory and my ultimate good. Sometimes that's hard, hard to take. As with Joseph, he uses tragedy to accomplish his will. Pray, pray, pray. Even if you're mad, if you're disappointed, pray, pray, pray. Don't stop praying and don't be selfish. Let everyone know your prayer request so they can pray too. 
Any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. And as you're driving your car, it's prayer in the, in the wheel of life. Is prayer your steering wheel? Or is it your spare tire? Are you just going to pull it out when everything's flat? And what about Jeremiah? He wrote a prayer journal, Lamentations. In uh, Lamentations 3, 2 through 8, some of us may have been, may have been where he has been before. Uh, I'm not going to read all of that, but he does. He cries out and he calls for help. Augustine said, how deep in the deep are they who do not cry out of the deep. So use your army of God's people when somebody says, hey, how are you doing? Oh, don't say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just great today. If it's not great, tell them. Say, I need, I need prayer and tell them. Because two, two or three are gathered, there I will be among you. And God works through our pain. A few years ago, Lisa Tierkehurst, I hope I'm saying that correctly, came to Paducah. We got several of us went to hear her. But she has a new book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And she's a great example of faith. And because uh, cancer and an unfaithful husband could have derailed her faith and ministry. But she says our disappointments can be the divine appointments our souls need to radically encounter God. We're not always going to get what we have expected. We need to meditate and pray God's word, a source of comfort. I have a friend who suffers with chronic pain, and she says that she focuses breathing and praying scripture to bring her relief and comfort, like 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. It's quite lengthy. I'm, not, I'm going to skip over that. But you can pray scripture. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear, because what can man do to me? And one thing that, an experience that I have had, was I was at the shooting at Heath High School in 97, and one of the... Um, ladies in the prayer group, Missy Jenkins Smith, was shot and left paralyzed from the chest down. She has a wonderful book, I Choose to Be Happy. It's an encouraging reminder of hope, love, and courage. And what Missy says is, I need to enjoy it and create as much good as it I can. I guess God knew I could do that. And I felt lucky that he picked me to fill that role in the world. Corey Ten Boom was a, a wonderful lady who she and her family helped work of, to bring and save Nazi Jews during World War II. And one quote that she said that I liked was, don't bother to give God instructions, just report for duty. How many of us try? to tell God what we want him to do. And once again, I, I thought of the Old Testament because I love those stories, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, were, they reported for duty, didn't they? And they didn't know whether God would save them or not, but they knew that he could. And that gives me faith in, in our trials because he says, if this be so, our God who is served is able to deliver us and he will deliver us out of their hand, O king. But if he does not, we want you to know, we'll not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So as you're ready to prepare yourself for the possibility of suffering, you have to keep God's word living in your heart, a prayer in your lips, and rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, about 11 years ago, I had a major shock in my life. I was working late at school, received a call, and I, the call was, you have, bre you have breast cancer. And I think, oh, well, of course I started with, why me? But then, as I got to thinking, I thought, well, why not me? Why, why should I not be the one in, I don't know what it is now, I think it, used, it was one in eight, it may be more. I should be the eight of my group that has that, all right? 
But I was so blessed all the way through that. I just, the blessings, I could just, just on and on and on. Um, even though you know it can always come back. God gives me that sense, that sense of peace. Sense of peace. Few lessons that I've learned on suffering. You have to do life the way God lays it out in front of you. Every day you have to do and, and accept what God withholds from your life. If you really want to stick it to Satan, praise the Lord and thank him for the work he's doing in you. Graciously accept what he withholds. Believe it, that it is a divine destiny one day. The Lord says, I know, you know, I have not done without cause all that I have done, says the Lord. So maybe your life hasn't turned out the way you thought maybe it should. Uh, you have to, I hope you're allowing the Spirit to work, accomplishing in you that the, what the Lord does want to accomplish in you. Through it all, remember, God doesn't love your suffering, but he definitely loves you. So when you walk through the darkest valleys, he'll never leave you. And when God brings trials into your life, don't question his love or turn away. God is doing something breathtaking in you, for you, and through you. Because he is with you and because the Lord loves you. And everything that happens to you is filled with a divine purpose. Every trial you endure has passed through God's loving hands. And one day, when your faith becomes sight, you will even thank him for every difficulty. And thank you. I appreciate your attendance today. And I hope this has been some encouraging. I hope the reference is there will help you take and, and, and look, and um, when trials come, that you'll be able to persevere. Thank you.